Good day today uh, from the uh, Asia Society and the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York. Um, and we're joining you for this first of our events for UN General Assembly Week uh, on this, the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the United Nations, a really important uh, anniversary. And on top of that, uh, it's also a climate week uh, in New York. And so for those reasons, we are delighted to be able to host today's event. Uh, my name is Kevin Rudd. I'm president of the Asia Society Policy Institute in New York. Um, we at the Asia Society um, have been in existence for nearly 70 years. Uh, and uh, our business has been to support engagement between the United States and the countries of Asia, and including China. Um, today, of course, uh, we're going to be dealing with uh, the great challenge of climate change. Uh, and uh, climate change uh, looms as one of the fundamental global challenges of the 21st century. Uh, it is also particularly important because we are preparing uh, for the hosting of the Conference of the Parties, COP26, uh, which will be held in Glasgow uh, next year. It's been deferred from this year because of obvious reasons from the COVID-19 crisis. But we are focusing on COP26 preparations and looking back over the last week, we're also focusing on that uh, critical set of discussions between the European leadership and uh, Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping, including its focus on climate as well, uh, both uh, in his discussions with Chancellor Merkel of Germany, as well as uh, Erika von der Leyen. And so for those reasons, uh, China looms large in our global conversation about the future of climate change, both what China is doing nationally, but also what China is doing multilaterally in its discussions and engagements with the Europeans, uh, it has continued engagement with the uh, Paris Agreement of 2015 and the nationally determined commitments uh, which China agreed to at that time. Uh, for our part at the Asia Society and the Asia Society Policy Institute, uh, climate is one of our core uh, pillars of work. We, of course, work on politics and security. We work on economics, trade and investment. But we also have as our third major pillar uh, climate and sustainability. And already in this area, we've been doing important work. Uh, we've been working with our friends in Beijing, but also our friends in Seoul and Tokyo and around the rest of Asia on how we develop emissions trading schemes, which are useful and substantive uh, within China itself and useful and substantive in the connectivity potentially between a Chinese emissions trading scheme and emissions trading schemes elsewhere in Asia. And this has been a core part of the technical and policy work which we at the Asia Society Policy Institute have been engaged with China on uh, for the last three to four years. And on that note, I notice that China's emissions trading scheme itself is about to become fully into operation. Now on the mechanics of today, today is being broadcast in English uh, across the Asia Society's channels. And the video will be available on playback online shortly on the Asia Society's website. It will also be available in playback in Mandarin for those who wish to look at it in Chinese. And today's format is very simple as well. Shortly, I'll turn to our guests to provide 15 or 20 minutes worth of opening remarks. And following that, um, uh, Minister Sierra and myself will be in discussion for a half an hour or so. Uh, if you should have any questions, uh, please uh, put them through uh, to our own link and they will be conveyed to me through my staff. And now it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our guest and one of the world's big champions for climate change action, that's Minister Xie Jinhua. Uh, I regard uh, Minister Xie uh, as a good friend and a great colleague. I've known him for the better part of the last 10 years. In fact, longer than that, I think, since we first met in and around the events at uh, Copenhagen in 2009. And for me, it's been fascinating to watch and critical for the world to observe the evolution in China's climate change policies since those heady days at Copenhagen through to Paris in 2015 and now to the present. Now, Xie Jinhua is currently the special advisor 
for Climate Change Affairs to China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment. He's also president uh, of the Tsinghua University Institute for Climate Change and Sustainable Development, a prestigious university and a prestigious, prestigious center within the university. In these capacities, uh, Xie Jinhua remains intimately involved in various uh, policy processes in China relating to climate change, including the development of China's mid-century climate strategy, and of course, where climate change and emissions reductions is located within China's next five-year plan. Uh, Xie Jinhua has been a climate change advocate for his entire professional life, most recently in office as vice chairman of China's National Development and Reform Commission. And perhaps uh, he's best known internationally for leading China's uh, delegation to the United Nations Climate Conference from 2017, from 2007 through to 2018. And he played a key role in both the landmark 2014 joint announcement on climate change between the United States and China, as well as, as I've just mentioned, the 2015 Paris Agreement, which followed. So, um, Xie Jinhua, Lao Xie, as I would address you in Chinese, uh, it's wonderful to have you with the Asia Society today. Uh, we look forward to your remarks for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, and I then look forward to joining you in conversation. Uh, Minister Xie, the floor is yours. Distinguished uh, Mr. Kevin Rood, my old friend, distinguished friends online, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening, good day. Thank you very much, Kevin, my old friend. And this is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to meet you online to talk about China and uh, the world climate action and to make interesting and proactive progress to promote the process of global climate change governance. Just now, on the anniversary summit, the Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping made the presentation highlighting the post-epidemic um, era how, what kind of role the UN should play to practice uh, the rule of law and also to highlight that China need to be the practitioner of a multilateralism. And he also highlighted that we need to put into place the 2030 SDG and use this opportunity to make the response to the health challenges those non-conventional challenges should be the priority for the work of the UN. And he also expressed the idea that China should be involved into the reform and uh, development of the global system and to promote the duty of uh, the community of a shared destiny for mankind. Maybe you've noticed that on September the 14th, President Xi, together with uh, the leaders of Germany and uh, EU, had a conference to talk about jointly building the environmental and climate high-level dialogue to highlight the green partnership with China and constructively participating into responding to the global climate change and to practice and protect the biodiversity and to support each other's efforts for the uh, COP conference held in Glasgow in uh, and next year and also the first biodiversity convention and we just hope that all this uh, initiative will be successful to promote the sustainable development of the world to make our new contribution which reflected the advocation of China in the low carbon uh, green and uh, uh, circular development and also the position and the policies in this regard so with uh, before the meeting uh, among the Chinese and European leaders with uh, my German and uh, European friends. We have some video conferencing and dialogue. We all expressed a very strong willingness to strengthen the Siemens cooperation to promote the multilateralism and also to put into place the Paris Agreement to respond to the climate change response. Uh, response process. I believe that China and Europe 
uh, are going to take proactive actions to put into place to promote the process. So by using this opportunity, we would like to join you to share with you the following observations. First of all, in order to the climate change in China, we have made some great uh, contributions and we laid some foundation for realizing the NDC in advance. And we always insist on green, low carbon and the circular economy and uh, the reduction of uh, uh, unit uh, carbon emission density is a systematic and uh, restrictive uh, uh, indicator system. And we have uh, the system uh, map and we propose that by 2030, we needed to take the carbon emission and also a set of uh, different uh, idea, uh, initiatives and we adjust the industrial structure to save the energy, to improve the efficiency of the liberation of the energy, to optimize the structure of energy, to develop a non-fossil energy and to develop the solar economy to improve the efficiency of the energy utilization and uh, to improve the conservation of uh, the forest and to improve the carbon thing and uh, also to carry out the reform on carbon market, to carry out South South cooperation of the climate change. We carried out a lot of measures to make the systematic activity in policies to build the green, low carbon, and circular, circular industrial development system to promote the energy reform, to promote a clean, high efficiency, efficient energy system, to put the climate change into the economic and social development in the all right way. And uh, in the result, we have uh, um, achieved the target. So we have made a commitment before 2020 and made obvious the contribution. And the practice of China have proven that uh, the response to the climate change, those policies are not going to hinder the economic growth. Uh, instead, it will improve the quality of the climate change to foster and bring up the new industries in the market and the employment to improve the life of the people, to improve the environment and the health level of the people, to realize the social, um, economic, climate, and the, the development all in all. And uh, we have uh, experienced that particularly in China. Take the NDC implementation of China, for example. And uh, we have uh, the benchmark year. Uh, of NDC. And uh, by 2019, we have a GDP growth by four times, and uh, we have uh, realized uh, the poverty alleviation for almost all the poverty population in China. And uh, the unit CO2 emission have reduced by 48%. We have made a commitment of 25% of uh, um, uh, high level, and uh, we have uh, received uh, um, realized. Uh, uh, the reduction of a 5.6 billion uh, of a carbon dioxide emission. And uh, we have uh, uh, realized uh, the installed capacity of uh, renewables uh, to get into a high level of the China, of the world, and 22% uh, of the, the energy mix in China. And the, the annual growth, annual growth of, has uh, increased the efforts from the two from 6% have from increased from, have reduced to the, the emission to around 2.2% and 0.8% from 2013 to 2018. Uh, the air quality has been And we have realized the important helping us to achieve of, uh, the climate the and the carbon emission and economic development to realize the NDC which has contributed to in the advance and we have a foundation of the reduction second, of the carbon intensity and to realize the NDC and high quality recovery after the COVID-19 and we are willing to make of what contribution and we for are the climate very change willing to contribute to and this to year we bring the, the world economy um, and really and that makes us realize, make us that. realize we are that closely the world is uh, a the community of the shared destiny no matter so in facing with we are incidents with the, the echo damage and the economic uh, damage challenges should be addressed no nope. not by just one country no nope. Country can stand alone. 
And uh, the climate change is also borderless. We need to strengthen the global cooperation to integrate the multilateral forces to respond proactively to realize the win win. And uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Kudlet, have put forward the initiative of the Green Recovery after the COVID 19. I cannot agree more with him. The COVID 19 is uh, the major uh, crisis of, of uh, the global health. And uh, the COVID 19 to the economy, especially on employment, there's a great uh, impact. And the climate change will be a longer and more in depth crisis for mankind. We have to be deeply rooted in the current situation uh, on the future to choose a pathway which is uh, in line with very good challenges at the moment and also to have a sustainable development with uh, multi wind. And I believe that only by insisting on green, uh, high quality, and a circular development can we turn the crisis into the opportunities to assist the different countries to work out of difficulties to realize the Paris Agreement and a global sustainable development goals to make a contribution to the following generation of the global village, create a beautiful future. The COVID-19 this year has opposed a great impact on the economic growth of China, which have a path to uh, turn the crisis into opportunities to stabilize the employment, finance, foreign trade, investment, and uh, a lot of um, other works to make sure the employment and livelihood of the public, to make sure the brain safety and industrial chain and supply chain stabilization, as well as uh, the grassroots level operations. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, promoted the 5G, big data, the internet, and the artificial intelligence, as well as uh, a lot of other new infrastructures to develop the new urbanization, to develop the new health and uh, smart city, smart transport, new energy saving and environmental circular economy, low carbon and zero carbon industries to foster the new driving force for the economic growth. In recent years, China insisted on the grain and the low carbon high quality development. And we are making the 45 year plan. And according to the related requirements of the Paris Agreement, we carried out a lot of uh, NDC related and long term low carbon emission research and deep rating process. And it's a strike that all the work will help us to do better work for the mid and long term and short term um, efforts to link with uh, the target of the national development and the protection of the eco environment to coordinate them to form a reverse uh, forcing mechanism so that to have uh, uh, to meet the commitment 100% and to strive to do even better. And I hope that you can trust us. We're going to launch a very powerful mid and long-term low carbon development strategy on time. According to my knowledge, the international community is focusing closely about the NDC and the 2050 low carbon development target of China. And we are making every effort to accelerate the process very rapidly. We're going to complete it it is convinced that China is definitely going to launch a very powerful low carbon development target. And I hope that you can trust us. Promote the high quality development and we're going to do the following work. First, to improve the structure of energy. China has started the revolution of energy and we're trying to best to build a clean energy, safe and green and highly efficient energy mix. We are developing and developed a financial, physical, industrial project-based management policies, among which the coal and the coal-fired power generation are under control. This is something that you are cared about. And in this field, for the development of coal-fired uh, coal power generation, something that, that you are interested in, 
we have new policies in this respect by 2020, the newly released green bond list, we have specified that we don't support any coal involved project and we are actively building the green belts and the whole and we try to guide the finance investment and the project overseas to went to go into the green and the low carbon development and we are going to control the consumption of coal and to develop um, gas and to develop nuclear power in a safe way and to improve the percentage of renewable energy and to make use of hydrogen in order to improve the electrification of the whole industry and we are intensifying the integration of information technology and energy so that to improve the digital and the smart trans transition of the energy system. I believe that the Ministry of Ecology and Environment and the NDRC are putting forward policies and very strict um, limitation policies to control the development of coal fire generate uh, coal fired power generation and you can stay attuned for the policies and we are pushing forward the improving and upgrading of industry we are going to push forward the 70 percent of the industry sectors to reach the peak during the 14th five-year plan and we are controlling the high consumption industries expansion and to control the emission of non-co2 emission promote the development of low carbon technologies. And we are starting the um, carbon emission in the manufacturing industry so that it can be developed to a decarbonized uh, direction and to push forward the modernization of industries and develop smart manufacturing and industrial internet. So industry has been accounting for 70% uh, of the emissions. So firstly, we require the industry to reach the peak of emission first. And thirdly, we are implementing the policies to develop infrastructure to avoid the locking effect of the carbon emission. And to, because China accounts for 20% of the global emission, and we are trying to control the building, infra, uh, building industry to push forward the flexible and the PV systems and to the, uh, as well as the transition of the energy system of buildings and to make full use of biological energy resources to develop a simple and low carbon and the green way of uh, life style. So because the building um, sector accounts for 20% of the Emission. So we are going to make full use of different technologies, plannings, and the programming so that we can forward the reduction of emissions during the 14th five-year plan and forcefully to build a low carbon and green transport industry. In China, transport accounts for 10% of the emission. Now we are going to pu pushing forward the adjustment of the structure of transportation and to give apply to the comparative advantages of different ways of transportation to transit to a green way of transportation and to make full use of the green power and engine of in the transport industry. So China is leading the way in the world in the development of electric vehicles. I believe that the carbon emission in the transport sector it's growing in the future, but still we need to do more in this um, in, uh, in this industry to control the carbon emission in the transportation industry. And fifthly, we're going to develop the circular economy to improve the efficiency of the use of the um, resources. And this is the basic way to decouple the economic development and carbon emission. And this is most the basic way to improve the efficiency of the use of resources. And in the industrial parks, we're developing the green structure and the industrial chain and the green industrial parks. And in the cities, we are going to develop the model for the circular use resources and to build um, waste-free cities and to develop a way for the recycle and reuse of waste so that all the players can benefit from this business model by the reduction of the use of resources and to make 
a recircular use of resources and waste and to improve the output of the resources and to reduce the waste carbon emission from the source. Sixthly, we are pushing forward the innovation of technologies. We are developing the low cost, cost effective technologies and the safe um, technologies that is uh, prospective and green and of low carbon emission and to develop the smart grid energy storage and distributed renewable energy and the hydrogen energy and other deep decarbonized technologies and to make research and development the BECCS and to develop the new generation material technology to push forward the integrated development together with information technology and rigorous efforts will be made to develop the vehicles driven by electricity and the hydrogen energy and to develop a full life cycle research circular utilization. Therefore, by 2050, in order to realize carbon neutrality or to realize the targets um, laid down in the Paris Agreement by relying on the traditional conventional way, it's not possible. So we need to make technological innovation. So we made it very clear that in the above sectors and industries, we should make a lot of innovations, laying a solid technological foundation for the realization of the targets. So by realizing the um, zero emission technologies can help us to reduce the cost and help us to achieve the target. So we need to make technological innovation. Seventhly, to develop a green and green finance. China is developing very actively the, fin the green fi uh, finance in China. The balance of the green finance is 2.1 trillion RMB and we have released uh, 350 billion green finance this year by giving full play to the leading role of the finance and the fiscal policies. We would like to attract the social capital to participate in the investment. And the PPP green finance project reached a total amount of 1.97 trillion RMB. We're going to implement the relevant financing and the funding mechanism laid down in the Paris Agreement and give full play to the leverage and leading role of the public um, funds, as well as to guide the social capital and the taxing and the taxes to go into the priority areas in the green finance, which is going to bring us a broad market and to improve the employment, the dig dignified employment opportunities. So in our planning, we have to, we have done the math that in the low carbon industry and in the um, climate change industry, we're going to create tens of millions of jobs with dozens, trillions of investment markets which will attract a lot of technologies and funds to come into this industry. Eighthly, the tax finance and the tax and the physical need to develop corresponding policies to realize the green and low carbon transformation. We're going to give clear signals to the market players that what are, what are we encouraging? What are we opposing to? What are we limiting? China is going to expand the public funds into the response and the support of climate change from the tax and the physical policies and the price policies to support green, low carbon, green building, EV, and low carbon upgrading, and as well as the green te technologies and products. Active actions have been done to full play to the role of the public funds to guide the ca social capital to come into the low carbon and the green industry. So our policy is basically that the public finance and 10% of them can leverage 90% of the social capital so that a very active monitoring and financial and fiscal policies are very important nicely to build a full-fledged carbon market. The carbon market and carbon pricing are very important to realize the, co the 
carbon emission targets in a low cost way, which also has a very good environmental and the social impact. On the on top of the pilot program of carbon market, we initiated the nationwide carbon market co covering the power generation industries, including 1,700 companies were going to increase cement, aluminum, steel and iron industries, which are the major emitters in the industry. At the, on the global scale, we're going to make use of the multilateral carbon market mechanism to protect the integrity of the market to prevent the leakage of carbon and to promote fair competition and to improve the intensity of carbon emission. While we are talking to the different parties in the EU and US, we're trying to implement the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement about the rules for the implementation of a carbon market. We don't support the unilateral carbon border adjustment policies proposed by some countries to avoid new conflicts in the world. Recently, I talked to the um, team dedicated to the research of carbon market in Tsinghua University, and I'd like to uh, discuss with you that maybe our two institutes can enhance our research work and analysis and the cooperation exchanges to push forward our local, sub-regional and regional carbon markets. The EU is very um, is a very active player in this. They want to continue with our cooperation, and our two teams are making some new uh, analysis or research work to contribute to the establishment of carbon markets, uh, which has been stimulated by the um, Paris Agreement. Essentially, we are trying to work with world countries to push forward the implementation of the Paris Agreement and to achieve the climate and environment governance. So the important thing is to implement the Paris Agreement and to improve the contribution of different countries according to their differentiated but common responsibilities. They should set up the goals and targets and adapt corresponding actions to push forward the upgrading and the transformation of their industries. For some countries, they can achieve the negative emission by 2050, some negative emission, some to reach the net zero or low emission. Only in this way, we can achieve the um, total global target for carbon emission. The G20 has contributed 80% of the carbon emission and the 25% of the total economic volume, they are the major forces in of implementing and realizing the carbon emission targets. They should, uh, they should provide technological assistance and financial assistance to the underdeveloped countries so that no countries will be left behind. In the past, China and the US work clo worked closely to promote the um, Paris Agreement contributing our due share to the re reduction of emission, no matter what the climate uh, policies will be in the US, we are very willing to work with the entities at the different levels and to communicate and exchange with them in the future. We, can, we will continue to continue uh, to continue with our communication and dialogue with the EU countries and also to um, continue with our South to South dialogues with developing countries. We will join hands with world countries to implement the Paris Agreement and to push forward the progress of carbon emission so that we can achieve a green high quality recovery and to build a community of mankind for a shared future after the pandemic. And the China and the EU leaders are having dialogues in and enhanced their mechanism for the protection of the uh, eco, uh, of the uh, ecological and civil civilization, as well as to respond to climate change. In addition to the EU countries who are willing to work with 
different countries in the world in this respect in the reduction of emission. So that's all for my part and very willing to discuss and to share um, my ideas with you. Thank you, Look, um, Kevin Rudd, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Xie. Uh, one of the things I uh, always enjoy about Minister Xie is his uh, intellectual habit of always seeking to be comprehensive. Um, partly, I think that's uh, in his character and partly it reflects uh, his institutional home in the uh, NDRC, the National Development Reform Commission of China. Um, many people have criticised in the past um, China's uh, approach to national planning. I think from the climate change perspective, uh, uh, national planning has a singular virtue, uh, which is how do you bring to bear all the different arms of policy in order to achieve a single policy objective, namely reducing greenhouse gas emissions to the extent necessary to keep temperature increases within 1.5 degrees centigrade. Uh, Minister Sierre's uh, speech uh, dealt with uh, the question of coal. Uh, he dealt with the question of um, um, the uh, energy sector more broadly. He dealt with manufacturing. Uh, he dealt with the transportation sector. Uh, uh, he also um, spoke of the other side of the climate change equation, which is how do you create jobs effectively and in sufficient numbers from the renewable energy sector uh, in order to make this a transformation in energy policy and in climate policy, uh, which supports uh, the well-being of working people across China and by extrapolation across the world. And he also spoke about uh, the policy settings nationally needed to do that. Uh, the National Emissions Trading Scheme, and we're pleased to work with our friends in China on that as an institute ourselves. And beyond that, um, of course, the critical role of technology. I think Minister Sierra said, uh, on current arrangements, we cannot reach our objectives. Technology is therefore necessary. And so the deployment of all arms of technology to secure China's climate uh, change and greenhouse gas emission reduction targets uh, is important uh, for us all. And then finally, he spoke about uh, where this fits in terms of international uh, arrangements. Uh, he spoke uh, at length about uh, the recent uh, engagements with the Europeans on this. Uh, and uh, he spoke about uh, the historical engagements with the United States on this, and of course, other countries. Uh, Minister Sierra, I suppose where I'd like to begin our, our dialogue with each other is on that latter point. Uh, in your remarks, you made uh, the statement, uh, China is going to launch a very powerful low carbon development target. Uh, that's my attempt to write down what you said. I've also noted carefully what the Chinese foreign ministry said, I think on the 15th of September, about uh, China's uh, efforts now to do more. Uh, about um, peaking its greenhouse gas emissions and also a possible timetable in terms of China reaching carbon neutrality. And of course, this is something the European leadership raised directly with uh, Xi Jinping uh, last week. So on these two big questions for the world, Minister Xie, which is uh, can China uh, bring forward its... Uh, its greenhouse gas peaking year, currently at 2030. The Europeans have asked for 2025. Can you do better than that? And then on carbon neutrality, the Europeans are asking for 2060. Um, perhaps if you could give our audience some insight into your own thinking on these two, shall we say, fundamental global questions for us all before we go elsewhere in our conversation. Over to you, Minister Sierra. Uh, Actually, in my presentation, I've mentioned several points already. First of all, about uh, the target for 2020 and also the NDC target for 2030. And the target for 2020 
have uh, been realized for two to three years in a row because we have realized the state targets to contribute to the realization of the 2030 target realization. And at the moment, I've been involved into the making of uh, the NDP upgrading plans and the 2050 low carbon development strategy research and the uh, debate, as well as uh, the climate change related targets during the 14th five year plan, uh, including the policies, measures, and actions we're going to take during the 15th five year plan period. For those um, discussion work, it is a uh, the consolidation of the wisdoms of uh, different experts from uh, different walks of life and even from the businesses. And we have uh, completed them basically, as I've mentioned, basically. But in the end, we will definitely offer and deliver some uh, plan which is uh, doing more and even better the updates for NDC 2050 low carbon development plan. But as for the timetable, when they are going to be delivered, at least according to the Paris Agreement requirement by the end of this year, I believe that you can count on us that we definitely will launch on target. However, at different fields and different industries, we already have taken actions, especially for the local governments. They've been doing research about how to peak in advance, I mean, for the CO2 emission and uh, to realize the revolution in the energy sector and how to improve the efficiency of utilization of energy to have a more energy efficient environmental um, energy use. And for the carbon neutralization, except for the uh, emission reduction and the carbon emission reduction, and we need to increase more carbon sink. Those are the efforts of the local governments. I've received a lot of uh, major leadership from the different municipalities and local governments. It's been quite active in those regards. I believe that those work will be completed gradually. I believe that in the end, we can wait until the Chinese government launch the final report. I can only tell you that we are doing things, we're making efforts, and that's definitely favorable for the realization of the target. But we have to be patient to wait uh, because all those work are going on smoothly and we've been involved and we know something about it, but they are not finalized yet. So we have to wait. And, um, but please be comfortable with the result. Thank you. Good. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Minister Sia. Uh, I know enough about politics to know that sometimes it's important to wait. And so uh, we look forward to the announcement of the uh, uh, Chinese targets on these questions. Um, Minister Sia, you also spoke about our current economic context. And of course, we cannot discuss uh, the future of greenhouse gas uh, reductions in the absence of discussing the current global uh, recession, which has been brought about by the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, and nor can we discuss uh, our efforts on climate change in the absence of looking at the national economic recovery plans of major economies around the world. You mentioned in particular the G20 economies. And so uh, you yourself, Minister Sierra, have written about the importance of a green economic recovery. Um, and you've given some details. Uh, you have spoken in particular about what's happening with China's um, uh, electric vehicle revolution. The plans are ready to put out uh, EV charging stations around uh, the country. This will be massively transformative. Uh, for China and therefore for the world. Um, then, of course, there are other pressures when it comes to economic recovery, which are less green. And of course, uh, uh, the international community has monitored the increase in the number of coal-fired power stations being approved in China in recent, um, uh, rec in recent times. Um, and of course, these are pressures faced by governments around the world. Uh, could you give us some insight into 
the direction of China's uh, efforts at green economic recovery, and in particular, the continued challenge and difficulty of coal. Over to you, Minister Xie. About the issue of a green recovery, during the epidemic, uh, Secretary General Guterres and uh, the sending Vice um, Secretary General caught me to put forward that during the epidemic, people's attention has been pulled into the response to the outbreak, uh, the sudden outbreak of the public health crisis. And uh, the world economy has been affected greatly. Uh, so is China, uh, which won. There is a negative of 6.8% of growth. And the second quarter, we had a little bit of improvement and for Q3, uh, it's recovering. But generally speaking, people's attention has been shifted to the respond to the epidemic and to stimulate the economy to increase employment, to maintain the stability of a society, which are the most urgent needs. So in dealing with these emergencies, we have to take into consideration the long-term severe challenge of a climate change because it's more in-depth issue. So at this point, we have to do a really good job. In China, I've been highlighting that in different sectors, we have to be deeply rooted in the current situation and also eye on the long future. To have a strategic mind, to keep a strategic resolution. What is strategic resolution? Which is transformation. No matter for the thermal development targets or the target to respond to climate change, to protect the environment, to safeguard the national security and energy and green security, you have to keep this kind of uh, strategic resolution, which is transformation. Only when we realize that the green and sustainable transformation can we address all the targets. It will only talk economy for the sake of the economy and it talk in society and climate for the sake of them. And if you talk about the biodiversity for the sake of the biodiversity, the result will be we do things, but we have just a half of the results, which means that we invest a lot, but we didn't get an equal return. So we have to have uh, the synergy of them. So in the result, we will shoot two birds with one stone. So we have to transform, which is reflected in the industrial structure, energy structure, the production model, consumption model, and the lifestyle, etc., in different walks of life. So at this point, in making the 14th five-year plan for China, and uh, NDC upgrades, as updates as well as the low carbon development plans for China. We have already taken them into consideration and the nationwide we have uh, set forward a target to realize the modernization by 2030. By 2050, we're going to grow into a strong nation of the modernization. So those targets are in line with the global climate change and environment targets. So if we design them in the coordination, then the economy, society and climate can be well coordinated to offer a more uh, coordinated solution. So for green recovery, in terms of philosophy, theory, and practice, we have to address them in our right way, instead of um, only to address the one problem at that point. When there's an epidemic, we think about the epidemic, and when there's climate problems, we only think about the climate problems. And that is something that we have to think about for the grain recovery. So we will make the long-term plan and a 45-year plan. First of all, we have to find out our standing point. Then we can address them. And as I've introduced already, we start from what the different industries are doing and what are the technologies we need to apply. So after setting up all those targets, what set of economic facilities we have and uh, how to utilize the market mechanism. Those are the problems we need to think about for the uh, green economy. For EV, we have uh, half of uh, the EV population in the world and uh, we are also making an effort to develop it. And the, the proportion of it is improving. And now we need to improve the quality and uh, the mileage. And we're making a lot of efforts 
and we have to develop the hydrogen vehicle. And uh, there's a lot of hope for it. I know that a lot of enterprises, uh, they have uh, developed a lot of new energy vehicles. By the end of the year, some of uh, the companies are going to produce them in large scale. And to rely on the PV power generation, large amounts of PV um, energy. So to produce electricity and then provide it to the transportation. So we are developing very quickly in this respect. And I welcome you to visit China to see the development of hydrogen energy in China. We made some progress in this respect. If we can solve all those problems and issues about the development of EV in the transportation sector, we need to control the 10% uh, of carbon emission in the transportation sector so that we can bring down the percentage of the carbon emission in this industry so that to contribute to the long-term carbon emission of China. And for the charging stations, in order to develop EV or hydrogen uh, fuel vehicles, we need to solve this charging station problem, I believe, because there are a lot of elect uh, electricity companies. They say, uh, I, I'm willing to do this for free. They would like to occupy more market shares for the charging station, like in Hainan province, because they're developing this free trade zone. They're willing, uh, they are planning that uh, in five years, before 2030, they are going to um, see that all the vehicles in that island are EVs. Some, com some uh, provinces and the cities are doing very well in the charging station, like in my community. If you, bought, if you, if you buy an EV, there will be someone coming to your doorstep to install a car um, charging station for you. As, so we can say that uh, our people are, are very willing to buy EVs. And some um, insurance companies and the banks, they have built a green vehicle mobility program. If you are, so if you don't drive a fuel, uh, fuel uh, the, uh, the oil car, so if you drive your EV, so I will give you an incentive. So this is something that has been promoted in the civil society. So, and we are very uh, positive about the development of EVs. Every time when I was having a dialogue with our foreign friends, they're very curious and interested in the development of the coal-fired power plants, especially the, uh, along the and they have provided us, and then they sometimes complained about the construction of power, coal-fired power plants along the Belt and Road. So we are studying how to solve this issue. Our, in our next step, we are going to reduce the percentage of coal in the primary energy consumption and to improve the percentage of non-fossil fuels. Actually, the percentage has been greatly improved, but will continue to improve its quality and to improve its efficiency. So we need, we need policies in place to do this. We have started, like I said in my speech, about our financial system some of the uh, our major financial systems have proposed that they are not going to provide uh, loans and financing to coal and coal-fired power plants. The authorities have already um, put forward the uh, limitations and the policies in place, no matter the market. But for market-based projects, they need the support of financing. In terms of the risk evaluation financing, we are adopting limitation policies so that we can solve this problem. We are not willing to do this, but like some countries, they don't have any power. They, they need electricity. They would like to build coal-fired power plants and we can discuss with them. If you don't build coal-fired power plants, we can build some other cleaner um, power generation plants. This is something that we, uh, that is possible. So this is based on the different contexts and situations in different countries. So we need to discuss with them about this. And you will see that in our 14th five-year plan, no matter is coal-fired power plants or the development of coal industry, we're going to adopt very um, strong policies to live up to our promises in this sector. And very, I'm very um, optimistic about this issue. I believe you have uh, your concerns about this industry, but actually we are adopting very active uh, policies to solve this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Sia. We've, um, and for your um, 
uh, reminder about where China has traveled from and to on the question of coal. I think when I first went to live in China in the 1980s to work, uh, coal represented probably about 90% of total energy supply. I think that figure is now down from memory to about 58%, and I think it's heading towards 50. Um, so I think the view of the international community um, is to encourage China in this direction. And also, as you said, with China's international uh, cooperation partners through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, to encourage them and their, in their energy needs to go straight to renewables uh, rather than to build coal. And we see that even under the BRI, you've done some renewable projects, but I think uh, both the Europeans and ourselves, uh, we would encourage uh, you in China to continue to make that shift onshore and offshore with coal. The last question I've got for you, uh, Minister Sierra, in our limited time available, is the, uh, is the emissions trading scheme, which China is now uh, uh, operationalizing. It will be the um, largest uh, emissions trading scheme in the world. Uh, initially, it covers your stationary energy sector. Uh, I think China has indicated that it will move out soon uh, to cover uh, other sectors, uh, including uh, the future uh, of aluminium, cement and steel, which you mentioned yourself before. Uh, Minister Sierra, when do you see the scope of the ETS changing beyond the energy sector to take in these other sectors? And what percentage of the economy do you think your ETS will eventually cover? Over to you, Minister Sierra. And we've got about five minutes remaining. For the carbon market in China, or the emission trading system in China, we are um, demonstrating and discussing um, our climate change plan. So we also talked about this issue. You will see in our um, plan that firstly, for the, so everything is prepared and we are accelerating our pace for the rules and policies for the management of the ETS or carbon market to ensure the sustainable and the stable operation of the market mechanism. And we have, we have reached a consensus in this respect and we are accelerating the development of those rules and policies. And I believe very soon we are going to start the trading and uh, so we first include the power sector because the because we have the most accurate knowledge and understanding about the power sector so we are going to give a more accurate stringent tasks to the power sector after the power sector or the electricity sector we're going to move on to see to cement iron the steel and in the future, we're going to take into consideration of carbon sink products to be incorporated into the ETS. The, um, the plan is, under, is undergone improvement in, because we made some, uh, we are very successful in the pilot projects and we have a, laid a very solid foundation for the price and the trading. All the fundamental works have been finished, all the emitters, the quotas, the um, calculation and the accounting of the targets, but in the end, the management rules and the policies will be published in the end and to be promoted and implemented nationwide. Just now, I want to uh, I want to touch upon the coal here. About the peak uh, of the coal is 2013. And then it plateaued through 2015. And till now, China's coal production and the consumption has never been higher than the peak from 2013 to 2015. And the output and the consumption has been plateaued or with a little bit fluctuation. This is the reality in China. We have never gone above the level from 2013 to 2015, and in the 14th five-year plan, we're going to continue to bring down the coal consumption and the production, so you can be confident in us. This is about the carbon market, and we realized that 
carbon market or the ETS is the long-term solution for the reduction of the emission with the lowest cost. So we are going to um, push forward and to promote and implement it in a steadfast way. Because I'm, I am very, uh, I am working very hard to push forward the carbon market in China. But now we have uh, reached the consensus to build the carbon market. I hope that through the carbon pricing, we can help them to reduce the cost and to realize the carbon emission target. Well, Minister Xie, you've been very generous with your time with us today here at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Uh, a couple of concluding remarks before I thank you. Um, first, you've been um, a very uh, clear in your presentation of where China wants to go in more ambitious uh, targets for uh, peaking its greenhouse gas emissions as well as achieving carbon neutrality. Uh, and you've been very clear about your emission, your objectives as far as uh, the future scope of your own domestic carbon market is concerned, as you've been very clear about the central role of technology uh, in transforming uh, our ability to manage electricity and energy demand on the one side and to provide new and better forms of uh, energy supply on the other. And so um, it's been a very productive uh, dialogue. Uh, two uh, concluding thoughts. Uh, one is you mentioned um, the importance of being able to uh, readily access uh, an electric uh, vehicle and supply it out of renewable sources. Uh, my wife has obviously taken your advice. Uh, in the last three weeks, she's been putting 32 new polar solar panels on our roof here in Australia. Um, she now tells me we're generating 10 kilowatts uh, and, uh, and uh, with pumping three kilowatts back into the grid. Uh, and she also plugs in her electric car in the garage. And so um, she's trying to do her bit to save the planet, um, just like China at a much greater scale is seeking to do its bit to save the planet as well. And finally, on that score, I think um, we've been able to discuss the importance of China's national actions, but the importance of China has continued active work with the European Union uh, on global climate action, including through the agency of the G20. And I think we'd all welcome the day when uh, China can resume its active climate change policy collaboration and uh, global uh, policy coordination with the United States on climate change as well. After all, America and China remain the world's largest and second largest emitters. And where you two guys go, so too does the planet go as well, plus the Europeans. And the rest of us, important, but you three are central. Uh, Minister Xie, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Uh, I regard you, as I said at the outset, as a friend and a colleague. Uh, most importantly, though, as someone who has heart and whose mind has been fully engaged on the climate change challenge uh, for well over a decade now. And for that, uh, we thank you as well as for the time you spent with us today.